towering, snow-clad mountains that reach for the sky, crashing waterfalls that leap to the valley below, deep blue lakes set between purple hills, and quiet, vagrant rivers edged with gold. In Victoria's bushland setting, Nature has fashioned for the traveller scenes of infinite beauty. For the angler, nature has endowed the waters with fish, to which man has added the trout. And from early September, he may revel in his favourite sport. But as with all wild creatures, Nature has decreed a time to mate, and from April's close, rod and line must be laid aside. At spawning time, in obedience to instinct, the trout leave the languid waters of the big rivers, the placid depths of the great lakes, and follow the tributaries upstream to the breeding grounds beyond. Beyond the creeks they go, where the air is sweetened by the scent of wattle. Beyond the falls that tumble and shut, even beyond the mountains, where the snow-fed water, cool and clear, laughs and dances over a fine bed of small polished stones. Here, in some quiet, shaded pool, surrounded by flowers and other wild things of nature, the female prepares a place in which to set her eggs. This she does by patiently scooping out of the creek bed a trough-like hollow called a red. After the eggs have been laid and then fertilized by the male, they are covered by about six inches of gravel and the trout move on, leaving the eggs to hatch and be reared by natural means. But the casualties are high. Often only two or three percent of all eggs laid ever hatch and survive the first year. Yet when man with his science assists nature, up to 70 percent of the eggs are successfully hatched and nurtured to strong, healthy fish. In this modern fish hatchery, established at Snobs Creek by the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, the biologist, in his well-equipped laboratory, together with the field assistants, raise and liberate into Victoria's lakes and streams two million fish annually. Indeed, a rich trout harvest. To obtain new breeding trout as a supplement to the brood fish reared by the hatchery staff, a fish ladder was built to trap wild trout in the Goulburn River. The fish are taken back to the hatchery and introduced into the brood ponds, where, if suitable, they'll remain as stud fish. 
feeding time, and the brood fish leap to a feast of bullock's liver and heart. Crayfish shell is added to produce a desirable egg color. Three thousand brood fish, some up to 25 pounds in weight, consume one ton of meat weekly. Once a year, beginning in June, the fish are netted from the ponds for stripping. After testing for ripeness, the henfish are stripped of their eggs by a unique method developed at the hatchery. A hypodermic needle, which is attached to a length of plastic tube and a hand pump, is inserted into the body cavity, and the eggs, painlessly and without injury to the fish, are forced out by air pressure. Each fish will produce about 1,000 eggs the size of a pea to each pound weight of fish. A sample of eggs from each female is tested against standards for color and quality. A measured quantity of milk taken from the males is added to the eggs, which are gently stirred to ensure proper fertilization. After washing to remove all residue, the eggs are carefully laid down on wire mesh trays in the darkened hatching house, where under controlled conditions and with cool, fresh water constantly running over them, they'll begin to hatch after about 50 days. Hatching time, and it's a time of great activity for the fish embryos and the newly hatched fish or alevins. The eyes of the embryos may be seen moving through the transparent shells, and the young alevins, wriggling and jostling, still carry the yolk sac from which they'll draw their nourishment for their first few weeks of life. These close views show the beating of the heart of the half-inch long alevin. The hatching of a baby fish is accompanied by periods of great activity and rest. Here we see the inert form of an embryo. Near the bottom of the shell is the fracture through which the baby fish will pass. The head is the first to hatch and immediately the gills begin their proper function. After a further rest period, the whole fish finally emerges and casts a bright eye over an exciting new world. In the safe environment of the hatching house and secure from the voracious appetites of predators, the alevins grow into fine, vigorous and healthy fry. Later, they are put into the rearing ponds, where they'll remain until large enough to fend for themselves. When the fry have grown to about three inches in length, they are netted from the rearing ponds in preparation for their journey into freedom. They are transferred to the liberation shed. The yearlings, as they're now known, are counted. The fish are added to a gallon of water and their number calculated by a displacement scale. 
The yearlings are then transferred into large drums, each containing 10,000 fish, which are then loaded onto the liberation trucks. A tranquilizer is added to the water to calm the fish. This reduces their need for the oxygen stored in bottles that must at all times aerate the water during their long journey by road. The distribution of fish into Victoria's lakes is usually carried out from boats. Liberation by aircraft, however, is more satisfactory. Within an hour of leaving the hatchery, a cargo of 50,000 fish may be released into some distant lake, a journey that may otherwise have taken two or three days by truck over road and mountain track. Into the lakes goes the trout harvest, Eildon, Fiant, Wartook and Glen Maggie. Into the rivers to replenish their waters, Ovens, Flanelg, Halqua and Goulburn go new generations of game fish to challenge the skill of the angler. In Victoria's lovely waters, the trout beckon, and the young in search of adventure, and the old in search of peace, join with the sportsman angler with his flies and spinners to hunt the wily trout. From near and far they come, spinning, casting, ever hopeful of what the trout waters may yield. Here, where the silence was once broken only by the song of the bush, the staccato notes of the reel may be heard as the supple cane bows low to a rainbow.
And if at the end of the day the bag is light, well, put it down to luck. For the trout are there in river and lake. As the dying embers of the sun blush with pink the folding hills, and the shadows of evening imperceptibly fall upon the darkening water, there lie the trout, a heart of man's ingenuity, the trout. <laughs> 